Right, well, it is a very great pleasure to, um, uh, very great pleasure for us to be here, and thank you very much indeed uh, to Beth uh, and, and Ellen and others for, for laying on such a wonderful venue for it. So, my, um, I, I've been asked to uh, introduce linguistic ethnography as a multi method approach to discourse and social interaction, and I think there are the two ways in which I could do this, either I could treat the word development historically and give an overview of the different traditions uh, of research that linguistic ethnographers draw on, or alternatively I could work, uh, interpret the word develop you know, um, uh, as produce and then illustrate a multi-method analysis of discourse and social interaction with the analysis of a single piece of data. And uh, I'm going to take that second option, uh, mainly because it fits with today's focus on, on data, but also because there's, a, there's an overview of different approaches and um, traditions in the paper that we pre-circulated called... Um, Neo Himes in Linguistic Ethnography in the UK. And of course, I'll be happy, very happy indeed to engage in any of those issues that arose in the discussion after what I'm going to say now. Uh, but um, for the next 25 minutes, I'll begin with a sketch of the tenets, analytic resources, and empirical horizons in linguistic ethnography. Then I'll try to illustrate this in an analysis of social class in interaction and after that I'll conclude with some remarks about linguistic ethnography's relevance to the contemporary era and some ideas about how you might fit this into your own research okay. and I'm going to whiz through uh, the whole thing, I could, I mean in principle I could stop at different sections but there isn't the time for that okay, yeah, but we'll have time at the end for discussion so first if everybody's got a handout yeah, um, let me turn to the tenets, horizons, frameworks and goals of linguistic ethnography and this may seem rather a fast canter but the point of the second point, the second part of my presentation is that we go back to this illustrating it all in a, in, in, in a, piece, of, in a piece of data. Yeah? Okay. So, linguistic ethnography is something of an umbrella term but whatever the difference is between sub-traditions linguistic ethnography holds that one the contexts of communication should be investigated rather than assumed. Meaning takes shape within specific social relations, interactional histories and institutional regimes. It's produced and construed by agents with expectations and repertoires that have to be grasped ethnographically. Okay. And um, analysis of and I think that's you know, that emphasis on grasping the context ethnographically is maybe what distinguishes the line of work that we're talking about here from, let's say, conversation analysis, or at least in its stricter forms, and critical discourse analysis, where the ethnographic commitments aren't, aren't, aren't of the same order. So that's the first tenet. The second tenet is that uh, the analysis of, analysis of the internal organisation of verbal and other kinds of semiotic data is essential to understanding its, um, the data's significance and position in the world. Meaning is far more than just the expression of ideas and biography, identification, stance and nuance are extensively signalled in the linguistic and textual fine grain. Okay? Now you can count those two uh, sets of claims as basic methodological tenets. And the empirical horizons that they open up are very broad. Yes, you're looking at communication, but you treat communication as the temporal unfolding of social process orienting to at least three focus points. So one of these focus points that you can... You, starting point for analysis, for example, is individual persons their physical bodies, senses and perceptions, the cultural and semiotic repertoires, the resources they have at their disposal, their capacities, habitual practices, dispositions, the capaci 
uh, their likes, dislikes, desires, fears, commitments, personalities, their social status and category memberships. That's when you want to talk about individual persons. Okay, whole range of things you can address. Situated encounters are another point of focus. And here you look at events, genres, types of activity in which individuals interact together, the physical arrangement of the participants and the material setting, actions, sequences of actions and the use of semiotic materials, the inferencing, the interpretations and the efforts that participants make together to understand and influence each other, the origins, outcomes and wider links, how signs, actions and encounters fit with interactional and institutional processes over longer, broader stretches of time and space. And then third, what you can reckon with, are institutions, networks and communities of practice, which can vary in their durability and scale from playground peer groups to clubs, and schools, mass media, government policy. And here, when you're looking at these things, there's, a, there's an interest in how institutions shape, sustain and get reproduced through texts, objects, media, genres, practices, etc. As well as an interest in how institutions control, manage, produce and distribute persons, resources, discourses, representations, ideologies, spaces, etc. So putting all this together, so putting all that together, the assumption is of course that persons, encounters, and institutions are profoundly interlinked. The repertoires of individuals get used and developed in encounters. Encounters enact institutions. Institutions produce and regulate persons and their repertoires through the regimentation of encounters, etc., 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 all with varying degrees of friction and slippage. Okay. A tangle you might say, but uh, to, we can get purchase on these empirical resources, these empirical processes, with at least four major sets of analytic resources that you can draw. A, first, there's linguistics and discourse analysis, which provides a view of the uh, expressive affordances of the linguistics resources, the semiotic resources that participants draw. Second, in Goffman and conversation analysis, there are frameworks and procedures for investigating situated encounters. And these can help us see the ongoing sequential construction of local architectures of intersubjectivity they help us to see the rituals and moral accountabilities permeating the use of semiotic forms and strategies. They help us to see the shifting spatio-temporal distribution of attention and involvement in situations of physical co-presence. I mean, I'm just, if I'm going fast, apologies, but this is on the handout, so you can read along. I may be talking at reading speed, so anyway. Third, third resource is ethnography, which, for example provides you with a sense of the stability, status and resonance that forms, strategies and materials have in different social networks beyond the encounter on hand. And it also, ethnography also provides you with an idea of how and where an encounter fits into longer and broader biographies, institutions and histories. And lastly, very important, there's a, a, a vital place for other public and academic discourses in a kind of linguistic ethnographic account. Vital place for other public and academic discourses which provide the, the purpose and relevance for analysis, as well as a broader picture of the environment where the situations, where the study is cited. Now, I will il illustrate all those things, I hope, in a way that, that this that just isn't a kind of rather tangled list of stuff chucked together. Um, but um, when you do pull all those things together in the empirical analysis of recordings of interaction, you aim for an account that respects the uniqueness, deficiency and exuberance of the communicative moment. But also you want an analysis that describes how participants handle specific forms, strategies and materials. And that an analysis that also tries to 
understand how all this feeds off and into local social life.